Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this Health Foundation webinar. Uh, I'm Jennifer Dixon, and I'm really pleased to be your chair today. Um, we all know that the pandemic has been tough for us all, 128,000 deaths and counting to date, a 10% drop in GDP last year, and 2 million children facing food insecurity after only one month of the pandemic. That's just some of the statistics that, uh, that we've seen and we'll be looking at today. So it's been tough for us all, but much tougher for some. And we all know that the pandemic will cast a shadow into the future as well. So today, what we're going to do is to look in detail at evidence on what the pandemic has done to our health more broadly, and what this means for recovery and building back fairer in future. Uh, and this webinar is based actually on a major report which has been published today from the COVID impact inquiry called Unequal Pandemic. And you saw the slide at the beginning. Unequal Pandemic, Fairer Recovery is its title. And since last October, we've been carefully collecting evidence of the impact on health of both the pandemic and of the policies put in place to respond to it. And today we're really thrilled to be sharing these huge number of findings and discussing what needs to be done next. So first I'd like to pay tribute to Dame Claire Moriarty who chaired the independent expert advisory panel for this COVID impact inquiry and all 13 expert advisors. And also the Health Foundation Secretariat led by Dr. Merinisha Suleiman and team who we'll hear from in a minute. And above all, my colleague here, Dr. Joe Bibby who conceived and led the whole enterprise. So what we're gonna to do today is have Merinisha who led the Secretariat present the key findings followed by a really super expert panel who I'll introduce in a moment to discuss the findings and think about where next. Then we'll have a more general discussion and bring in some of your questions and we'll aim to finish at 1.15. But first, just a few housekeeping notes. The first one is, I think you all are familiar with Zoom by now, so please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen if you want to ask questions. And thank you for everybody who's already submitted a question. Feel free to add more. Don't forget that you can upvote questions you'd like to see answered if you like them. So click on the thumbs up icon by the question in the uh, chat box and the Q&A function rather. And we'll try and answer the most popular questions as well as, as, well as the most eye-catching. Um, this event is being recorded and the video is going to be available on our website within 24 hours. So please tell your friends. And for anyone wishing to tweet, today's hashtag is hashtag COVID-19 impact inquiry. So please get tweeting <clears throat> for those of you who like to do that. And most importantly, the COVID inquiry report is now available to download. So we'll send you a link to everybody who's uh, watching this now uh, later today, along with the video of the event. But for now, there's also a click in the chat box that you can click on to download. So have a look at that too. Good, so now what I'm going to do is introduce our first speaker, Marinisha, who is going to take us through the key findings of the report. And then I will introduce the panelists who will be responding to us today. So firstly, to hand over to Mar Marinisha, who is a senior research fellow uh, at the, the Health Foundation here. And she led the secretariat to this very long and um, <clears throat> detailed inquiry. Uh, Marinisha is a medically trained bioethicist and a public health researcher. And as I say, she spent the last um, nine months or so leading this inquiry. Very thrilled to hand over to you, Marinisha. Over to you, thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And good afternoon to everyone. I'll do the hardest part of my presentation, which is sharing my screen. I hope that's visible to, to everyone. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and uh, for, the, for the kind words and introduction. It's a wonderful privilege uh, to be sharing the findings of the inquiry with you today. After nine months of gestation, we deliver both the report as well as the, the technical supplement. And as, as Jennifer alluded to, what we've been doing is compiling the evidence to help us understand what has been happening over the last 16 months and to inform what action needs to be taken next. Although we don't have key recommendations in the report, we have highlighted key areas of focus that can enable us to ensure a fairer recovery. The inquiry has 
uh, involved a rigorous amount of work with a, with a fantastic team. And we've looked at an array of evidence, both quantitative and qualitative, and generously through the submissions we received to our call for evidence, but also that we've been expertly led um, through a, a, a panel um, of, of, of diverse um, experts. And also we've cons consulted people with, with lived experience. Of course, it isn't possible for me to cover nine months of work with you in 10 minutes, but what I will do is briefly cover how the UK has fared um, in terms of COVID outcomes uh, internationally, but also what has happened within the UK and how it is different groups in different areas have fared differently and some of the reasons for, for these differential outcomes. And finally, I will also go over some of the salient points that we cover in the report in terms of actions that need to be taken to mitigate immediate and future risks to health, and more crucially, help us to build resilience um, for the next um, shock. As many of you um, know, the, the, the data that has emerged over the last year it has been crucial for us to understand our place in terms of COVID outcomes internationally. A key question we were, we were seeking to answer in the initial part of the inquiry is how the UK has fared compared to other countries and why it has fared in the way that it has. This graph shows the cumulative excess mortality for the UK in the first two waves. And it shows how the UK had one of the highest excess deaths in the first wave, we did see a plateau of excess mortality over the summer. Unfortunately, this did this was followed by a very high um, second second wave, and this was partly due to the emergence of the alpha variant, but also the timing of of restrictions and the stringency of restrictions. Some of the evidence that we have reviewed shows that the timing of restrictions was one of the biggest components that helps to explain the international variation in excess mortality that we see. In addition to this, the UK also has um, a, a relatively high population density, as well as regional and international travel. It meant that we were more exposed as a nation to um, a, a virus like COVID-19. The other crucial factor is that we were less resilient as a population because of our underlying health. The UK has seen increased prevalence for a lot of healthcare, health conditions that are associated with worse COVID outcomes. In 2016, the UK had the highest level of obesity in the whole of Europe. And we know that obesity is associated with poorer COVID outcomes. Additionally, diseases like diabetes, um, cancer, as well as chronic respiratory disease, um, has a higher prevalence in the UK compared to the EU average. What it means is that in the decade leading up to the pandemic, we've seen erosions in our health, which has subsequently meant that we've been less resilient to a shock like COVID-19. Within the UK, we've also been trying to understand how different groups have fared differently. And this chart is an, is an example of, of some of these differential outcomes. We see that um, people in the most deprived areas, those aged over 65, have been twice as likely to succumb to the virus compared to those in the least deprived areas. Not only that, that this social gradient is much steeper for the working age population. People aged under 65 are 3.7 times more likely to die from COVID-19 than those in the least deprived areas. And the reasons for this are explored in more detail in the report, but just to summarize, um, two of the crucial factors are the likelihood of people being exposed to the virus because of their socioeconomic circumstances, but also their underlying health. Some of the work that's been done in the wider um, teams within the Health Foundation has shown that people in the, in the most deprived areas in, the, in their 50s and 60s are twice as likely to have two or more long-term health conditions. It means that prior to the pandemic, people in more deprived areas have had fewer opportunities for good health. Another crucial factor that we've been looking at to try and understand the differential impacts of the pandemic is the different jobs that people have been doing. Um, this chart here illustrates um, in terms of the red bars, 
the, the deaths from COVID that are due to infections acquired prior to the first lockdown, and the blue bars represent deaths that occurred after the initiation of the first lockdown. And immediately you'll see that lockdown saves lives. The red bars are significantly smaller than the blue bars, but you'll also notice that the blue bars from, for some occupations have remained larger, um, even after restrictions were in place, crucially for um, occupations um, like process plant and machine operatives, industrial jobs, who were unable to um, protect themselves even after restrictions were in place. This is because some people have had to continue doing the work that they do. They've not been able to work from home, but also there's been poorer access to sick pay as well as isolation payments. An additional bit of analysis that we've done that you'll be able to see in the technical supplement is that unfortunately, COVID mortality follows a pre-pandemic um, pattern of non-COVID mortality. What it means is that people doing certain jobs are facing poorer underlying health. And, and that has meant that they've seen this double impact of both being exposed to, to the virus, but also having poorer underlying health, which has meant subsequently they've faced poorer outcomes. In terms of the impacts beyond um, the, 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 the direct implications of COVID-19, there's a lot that you can um, uh, take from the report as well as the technical supplement, but I will summarize some of the key factors that we have out outlined in, um, in terms of our uh, actioning immediate and long-term risks to health. Short-term implications are the healthcare backlog. We know that um, the, 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 the health service um, has been redirected to, to manage um, COVID-19, but this has meant um, a, a, a backlog and unmet needs. Some of the work that the Real Center has done at the Health Foundation shows that there are 6 million missing patients. It means that people are living longer in ill health. They're presenting to the health service later, but it also means that once they are diagnosed, it is likely to impact their survival, particularly for people suffering from cancer. Living with restrictions as well as financial precarity and uncertainty has had a significant toll on our mental health. And, and this has unfortunately been sustained for at least a fifth of um, the population. And we've seen that this um, impact on people's mental health has been disproportionate for, for some groups, particularly women, young people, as well as those um, facing financial insecurity and in more deprived areas. The wider determinants of health we know are crucial and have also been impacted during the pandemic. Um, we know education is incredibly important for health and that loss of education poses future risks to health as well as income. School children have lost around two months of education. And, and what's crucial for, um, for me to highlight here is that the greater loss um, in, of learning has been for children from more disadvantaged backgrounds. Not only do we see this intergenerational impact on young people, but also that children from more deprived areas are likely to face more, more challenges and, and, and more erosions to opportunities for good health. Employment is, is incredibly important for good health in terms of living standards as well as um, self-esteem. And, and despite the emergence of green shoots, we know that many people are still out of work and some areas of the UK have been hit harder than others as the job retention scheme is being phased out, it's important that we think about um, access and, 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 and quality of jobs as we move towards recovery. The government has put in very important steps to support family income, but we've seen that many of the poorest families have had to rely on savings and debts, whereas wealthier families have managed to save during the pandemic. And as the £20 universal credit uplift um, will end in September, this will have implications for the poorest families. A key component of the COVID impact inquiry has been um, us reviewing the evidence to understand the disproportionate impact on, on specific groups, such as care home residents, disabled people, young people and ethnic minority communities. For example, ethnic minority communities have not only faced disproportionate burdens in terms of higher deaths from COVID-19, but they've also suffered 
worse mental health outcomes, um, more financial loss, have seen an increase in caring responsibilities and also higher levels of, of food insecurity. It's crucially important as we move towards recovery that we understand better the disproportionate impacts faced by some of these groups, but not only that, that many of these groups were facing inequalities prior to the pandemic. As we move towards recovery, there are a few things that we have highlighted in the report that will enable us to, to ensure a fairer and healthier recovery. And although the, the last year has been incredibly challenging, there are opportunities. The first is that there has been an increased awareness of some of these pre-existing pre inequalities that, that we've highlighted um, in the report as well as during this presentation. We did a recent poll where the public support, eight in 10 of the public support, um, these disproportionate impacts on different groups being addressed, that there's greater political recognition and acceptance for government action and spend to support recovery, and also um, a, a growing recognition about the importance of uh, local economies as people spend more time working closer to home. Additionally, more remote working and access to services the, the, the opportunity of flexible working will be crucial for disabled people, women, people with caring responsibilities who will benefit from um, opportunities opening up through, through more flexible opportunities that the pandemic has, has thrown up. Finally, a summary of some of the immediate and, and more long-term actions that need to be taken. We need to address the healthcare backlog, um, provide catch-up education and protect family finances, crucially through the making the universal credit £20 weekly uplift permanent. That's going to be a, a really important step to protect family finances. In terms of building resilience for the next crisis, um, high quality jobs, as well as strengthening local communities and ensuring the welfare state provides an adequate safety net that supports people through income and health shocks. We've learnt um, through the pandemic, the impact of poor statutory sick pay, and finally, the important, importance of sustained in investment that puts prevention first. Um, I, I do hope uh, this is a primer for you to look at the report as well as the technical supplement. Please do sign up for updates, and thank you so much. Thank you, Merinisha, for a very clear rundown of the absolutely basic headlines of this very long report. And for those of you who are asking, slides will be made available uh, to you all. Uh, and also, there's a very voluminous technical supplement that Marinisha referred to, which will keep you all busy. And that will address another person's question, which is, uh, to what extent do these data apply to UK or to England or to England and Wales? And all of that is detailed in the technical supplement, as indeed the report itself. Um, so before I just move to Claire, I just want to ask one question of Marinisha because it's picking up something you said, and it's this issue about the under 65s, which is quite interesting, and the, the health gap in COVID between the, 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 the most, those living in most deprived communities and those living in the least deprived communities. That gap seems to be bigger in the under 65 population for COVID infections than than um, in the over 65s, which is interest. Is that health gap as big normally? Um, is, is, is it bigger in the under 65 population without a pandemic? A really good question, Jennifer. And uh, no, we've seen that gradient steepen during, during the pandemic itself, which shows the, the implications of um, both exposure as well as underlying health in, in that age group. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot there, Monisha, but I knew you'd knew, you know the answer. So thank you. Let's move on. I'm just going to introduce panellists uh, as, as they speak. So I'm now going to turn to Claire Moriarty, Dame Claire Moriarty, who's chaired our COVID impact inquiry panel. And during that, that period, she also became chief executive of Citizens Advice. So, uh, so uh, so that's a great congratulations. Um, Claire um, actually is a great uh, rapporteur here because she uh, has been a distinguished civil servant um, in central government for 35 years. 
uh, latterly as permanent secretary of DEFRA from 2015 to 2019, and then at DEXU actually until January 2020. That would have been interesting, Claire. And she also, in uh, before that, made a very distinguished contribution at other departments, in particular the Department of Health, where I met her about 25 years ago, Claire, didn't I? So um, very uh, interested in your perspective here on the findings as chair. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jennifer, and it's great to be here today. Um, it's been a it's been an amazing journey to be part of the team uh, doing this report. I, a, a great privilege to chair the expert advisory panel, and I want to express my personal thanks to all of the panel members for the insights and challenge um, that you brought. Um, you know, connecting us to research, uh, bringing to life the experience of particular groups, and helping us to join the dots. And also to pay tribute to Marinisha and, and her team. One of the distinguishing characteristics of this inquiry, I think, has been uh, the, 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 the sheer variety of sources uh, of evidence. And it's been a, you know, it's, it's required, been a tr truly heroic task uh, to bring all of that together. So, I mean, having walked the journey with, uh, with the team, uh, I think there are three particular insights that, 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 I, that I have, and then a, a few points to make about how we might move forward. So, so the first is uh, it relates to um, what we call compounding issues and, and in, indeed the, the, the conversation that Jennifer and Marinesh were, were just having, because uh, some of you will have heard Michael Marmot talk about how uh, external shocks amplify existing inequalities. And I think almost with this pandemic, we've, we've been able to see how the mechanism of that works. We've seen how people in low paid jobs, in service industries, were the people who, who were most likely to have to go on working uh, outside the home during the pandemic. Um, they and they were the least able to uh, self-isolate uh, because there wasn't sick pay available. So they they were the most exposed to the virus, and they were also, um, for the reasons that uh, Marinisha was outlining, they're the people uh, who often have pre-existing. Uh, health conditions. So when they caught the virus, they were more likely to be badly affected. So we've had that really strong um, uh, compounding uh, compounding effect. Uh, and that's what gives us that really, uh, you know, shocking figure about the uh, the mortality, the, the excess mortality in, in under 65s. The second insight is, is how the pandemic has kind of shone a light on us as a nation. Uh, one of the expert advisory panel made the comment uh, to me that the uh, the, the, the UK is characterised by three eyes, um, inequality, infrastructure running hot uh, and international connections. Uh, and, you know, we know that the NHS tends to run hot. Uh, and one of the reflections we've had is that, that our social welfare system runs hot with the uh, level of income replacement that is low by uh, very low by international standards. Now, those are policy choices that are made by governments that are elected by us. Uh, so you could say that, that they reflect uh, the national, our, our national identity as much as anything else. And those policy choices in any environment uh, translate into uh, things that affect our lives uh, and then in turn affect our health. And normally that's a really slow process and it's very hard to see the impact of, of policies. But there's a slight sense that in, in the pandemic, because things happened so fast, we saw a kind of speeded up version of how policy choices translated into, uh, into people's health. And then that kind of takes me on to my the third insight, which is that the past gives us the future. Um, and we talked a lot uh, in the inquiry about the the last uh, the the recovery from the last global crisis, the two thousand and eight uh, financial crisis. Um, that was often described as being investment led. Um, and I was in charge of finance in Department of Transport at the time, and I do remember. Uh, getting a call at nine o'clock one night being asked if I could spend a quarter of a billion pounds by eight o'clock the following morning. Um, so there was a lot of capital, but actually what we all remember from that time is the austerity years as the effect on, uh, on public services, uh, you know, re reduced budgets uh, for local government. And, and, uh, uh, and you know, what we know is that that 10 year period uh, has coincided with uh, a significant flattening off of historic increases in life expectancy. Uh, and we know that those are in turn connected to uh, the higher levels of excess mortality. So there's a real sense that the, the nature, the shape of that recovery um, created the situation uh, that we had going into um, the, the COVID pandemic. And I think my contention is uh, therefore that we have to, the, the recovery from uh, the, the, the pandemic has to look different from the recovery from uh, the financial crisis. It's got to be a people-led recovery uh, in contrast to what one might regard as a concrete-led uh, recovery from, uh, from the, the financial crisis. 
And so what does that mean in practice? I think it means we have to be people centered in how we, uh, how we spend money. Uh, uh, we need to think about investment in early years, in education, in employment, in health and social care. But we also need to have a conversation about what we want from social welfare, how we're going to deal with uh, the debt and arrears that have built up uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we need to tackle that really uh, thorny question of why we don't spend money on prevention. We know that it's better value for money in the long term than dealing with problems when they arise, but something always gets in the way of, of uh, putting money into prevention. It'd be really interesting to see whether the integrated care systems uh, that are now being uh, set up actually you know, make any, any difference there. I think it also means we need to be people centered in, in, in our systems. Uh, one of the really interesting uh, changes brought about by the pandemic was lots of uh, services going online. So GP appointments uh, being you know, predominantly by telephone. Uh, we know that uh, putting things online has made them more accessible for some people, but less accessible for others. We know that there are health conditions that have been missed. Uh, we do need to think about how we make sure that public services are accessible. That's partly about digital exclusion, but it's not just about digital exclusion. In Citizens Advice, we're hearing about uh, local councils who haven't just closed their physical doors, but actually have become almost impossible to contact by phone, by email, through any other route. Um, and we see that playing out in terms of uh, problems not being addressed at an early stage and therefore being uh, becoming uh, you know, deeper and more entrenched. And, and we're seeing an increase in the complexity uh, of the case of the issues that people come to citizens advice uh, with as a result of not being able to connect with uh, with uh, public services at an earlier stage and, and that brings me to my last point which is i think we, we we've got to be people people centered in how we support people um, I, i've only been at citizens advice a little over two months but what i see is the the importance of the holistic approach that we have which is all about you know and people don't have one set of issues to deal with. They have all sorts of issues. Uh, I, I was allowed last week uh, with the permission of a client to listen into an advice call in which uh, when somebody talked through the issues they faced, it was a mixture of benefit, tax, pension, council tax, uh, physical disability, long-term health conditions and mental health. All of that in reality um, presents together. And we have to think about how we support people to deal with those issues, which do, of course, you know where, wherever they start off, they always end up uh, with people's health because that's the nature of uh, the wider determinants of health. And, and if I'm uh, j just a little plug uh, with my citizen advice hat on, advice is one of the things that can help uh, with this. We've been working with the Trussell Trust, um, who provide lots of uh, food banks, uh, really trying to. Uh, when people are at the stage when they need um, the, an input from uh, food banks, actually to try and give them help and advice that enables them to maximise their income, because ultimately it's a more sustainable solution if people can uh, have the income uh, and the financial circumstances uh, that enable them to move forward. And I think that's a great example of how we create that, uh, you know, the holistic sense, the people centred approach, which has to be um, how we come about, uh, we, we go about creating that healthy recovery. Thank you very much, Claire. A lot of food for thought there, which we're going to come back to in the discussion. Um, but one of the things that I want to just quickly ask is, it's interesting today, not only our report is being published, but also the uh, um, Office for Budget Responsibilities Fiscal Outlook is being published, which is a regular update looking at the economy going forwards and the stresses on it. Um, interesting that health doesn't really figure in the kind of risk factors that they look like they, they look at. And I'm wondering if if what what gets measured gets done is if there is an equivalent that we could do as a nation, which is looking at health capital and measuring that regularly. Uh, we, as you know, funded obviously funded this inquiry, which is great, but we also funded the two Marmot reports that came out last year, um, Bill Back Fairer and also the Marmot inquiry 10 years on. And uh, it takes an independent foundation to do that. So is there something that we should and could be doing OBR like to measure more carefully and regularly the health status of the population and projecting forwards to the, the health fabric of the country? which is necessary for its flourishing to, to concentrate minds. 
I mean, I mean, personally, I think I think it's it's really really important. Uh, I mean, when I was at Defra, we spent a lot of time thinking about natural capital, yeah. uh, which is the kind of the equivalent in the natural environment. And the reason for thinking about it is is was to get away from a, a, a situation where people tend to think about the economy and fiscal capital because that's what we're used to working with, and see other things as being a detraction from a drag on. So you get into that debate about. Uh, health versus economy that we've seen yeah. uh, playing out through COVID in the same way as we used to get into a debate about environment versus economy. And, and it, it, you need to get to a place where there's a where's a way of capturing how decisions impact on health yeah. capital in order to be able to build it much more securely into a decision making framework. And that I think that has to be the key to you know getting people properly focused uh, on it, not as a well, we're going to do, you know, we're going to do what's best for the economy and then see what happens to health. We've got to get embed that understanding that health is part of, you know, a healthy people are part of a healthy economy. Yes, indeed, a healthy under 65 workforce and uh, particularly the mental health of the younger the population. So thank you so much, Claire. We'll come back to those points. Um, I'm now going to introduce our next panellist. I'm very delighted to welcome Lord Simon Woolley, who is the director and co-founder of Operation Black Boat. Uh, Simon is also principal of Honiton College, uh, University of Cambridge, and also a working crossbench peer. Um, Lord Woolley was one of the architects of the UK's Race Disparity Unit, and he also served as the advisory chair of the Prime Minister's Race Unit under Theresa May, Prime Minister, when she was Prime Minister. So, um, Simon, very, very uh, big welcome to you, and we'd be very, very interested in your observations on some of these key findings today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And I just love listening to Claire and Muranisha, and uh, I look forward to, to Rachel and uh, Satkia too. I'm glad we got the we got the memo on the dress code, right, Satkia? You know, blue jacket, a tie, grey hair. Is that the, is that, the, and the that tick done? But um, Claire, I, I love your starting point. The the past gives us the future. Think about that for a second. The past gives us the future. It gives us the future, Claire, if we're honest, if we're brave, if we're united, it will really give us the future. And boy, don't we need that. You know, this past 18 months, for many of us, particularly in the health profession, but beyond, have been utterly, utterly heartbreaking, extremely challenging, and it challenged it in a ways which it shouldn't have been. Um, 15 months ago, when we saw on our screens the black and brown faces uh, that had fallen foul to COVID-19, disproportionately black, the doctors, the nurses, the security guards, the bus drivers, the COVID workers. And what many of us said in the activist world was, was what this deadly disease is doing is laying bare the fault lines, the, the systemic inequalities in, in, which, in which many of these areas were deeply racialized. Let's be honest. I remember being in the chamber, uh, speaking to a minister and he said to me, Simon, he said, he, Lord Woolley, he said, I think that this disease is a racist disease. I thought nothing could be further from the truth. This isn't a racist disease, but this disease is highlighting those systemic uh, societal fault lines that are that are racialized. Jobs, for example, zero hour contracts, low pay, in which people didn't have a choice to be protected, to be isolated. If they didn't work, they didn't get paid. They couldn't pay the rent. They couldn't feed the children. And because they were overly exposed to the disease, they caught it in greater numbers and inevitably died. When this heartbreak was unfolding, I thought, and many of us thought, in this very dark space, Jennifer, um, that that was that convulsed our society, along with the murder of George Floyd, you know, nine minutes, 29 seconds in front of our eyes, I thought we had the opportunity to have the greatest conversation about who we are and about the constructs of our society ever. You know, it was almost like a, after a wartime, 
in which where the NHS was built, you did big things. You 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 built it's not about building back better, we could build new better. Because because everything about it was raw. And in that rawness and in that pain, I I hoped, I desperately hoped that, that, we, that we would embark on a conversation, a journey, and a construction that would last for generations. That was the opportunity. What we got was denial, particularly towards us, which was heartbreaking again. First of all, you're dying in greater numbers. Then you're told, actually, it's because of your immune system. Uh, actually, it's because, it's because of your DNA. Instead of leaning into the societal determinants that have been laid bare and then effectively didn't, we got denial and we, we saw the government's health uh, COVID report to black minorities, um, uh, extremely disappointing. And then the sewer report, many in our community call it the sewage report because it denied our lived experiences. It denied the tenets of institutional racism. What I love about your report, Manusha, what I love about your report, Jennifer, it's honest. It is honesty. It says that we have an opportunity. You know what Claire said, that the past gives us the future. So if we look at the big picture, you talked about a healthy recovery. We, we can talk about unleashing talent. We can talk about not building back better, but building new better. That with that lens of being united, that saying that, that this is an opportunity for, for us to do things like we've never done before. You know, I've just come back from a Lord's meeting where we're looking at um, unemployment for young people. And we had a conversation with a leading activist from Gypsy Roma and Traveller Claire. And she told us that uh, Roma uh, Traveller kids are already 32 months behind in the educational cycle, 32 months behind. COVID has exacerbated that situation. And what we've got to acknowledge is that the, the fault lines have been pushed further apart. What's the answer? For your past gives us the future? Bravery, honesty, the collective will of all your knowledge, uh, Maranisha, that you've put in this wonderful report. This is the type of report that gives us the greatest conversation about, about how the past has negatively influenced the present, but how the past, if we learn from it, we can rebuild in a way that will last for a generation. I, I hope that, I hope that this will, I hope that we will lean into the facts, that we will lean into the honesty, that we will not engage in culture wars uh, because of you, we're not listening to you. No, no, this is about being fantastically united. We've all got the football match tomorrow. And I, when, I, when I see them black and brown, them, them black and brown and white players taking the knee and asking us to be bold and brave and then winning, this report sinks to that. Embracing diversity, uh, embracing the, the dynamism that we have in our nation, but also being honest. I'll finish on this because I know we've got a great, great conversations. You know what? My mother was the part of the Windrush generation. She came to this country and gave the best years of her life to the NHS. She has a bad brack to prove it, and hips and knees. She said back then you used to take people over your shoulder and wash them and put them back into to, 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 to the bed. Uh, and yet, and yet fast forward 50 years, when we look at the NHS over the, I don't know how many numbers of um, something like 350, uh, directors of health trust and only seven are from our communities it shows you the challenge the challenge that we've had but we can do it we must do it not just for us but for the generations that will follow so thank you Claire thank you uh, Jennifer 
and Maranisha for this wonderful, wonderful, brave report. Let's all get behind it, embrace it, and run with its possibility for the dynamic change that we can take from it. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, and um, one of the, just a question for you on, on, on that. Um, one of the things that we're pushing for concretely is a cross-government strategy on health to reduce inequalities. Cross-government, because as Claire said, a lot of the health issues we've seen, not just in the pandemic, but before, are down to wider determinants, poverty, education, poor work, that kind of thing, uh, which we all know about, we've known about forever. Um, so we're pushing, busy pushing for that. Um, and there, there isn't such a cross-government strategy at the moment. But what there is, is the bare bones of, of what's called a levelling up strategy, which I understand is being led by Neil O'Brien in the Cabinet Office, that is a cross-government levelling up. And from your position in the Lords, I don't know what you're hearing about that, whether you feel that that is a vehicle to attach any hope to, should we be mm -hmm. aiming for that, uh, to be pushing that further, or is it really a pragmatic political uh, exercise uh, for the short term? Well, well, I'm afraid politics is, is um, and tribal politics is far too prevalent at the moment. And you know, people fear that leveling up is at times, Jennifer, dare I say it, pitting poor white people against poor, poorer black Asian minority ethnic individuals. And that would be a tragedy. We take politics out and love our nations to, to come together and then have that cross party. I'm pleased that I'm a cross party bench, less, less tribal, but most many peers are non-tribal as a matter of fact, but uh, we have to find that vehicle. And you talked about a strategy for tackling systemic race equality. There is no strategy, no strategy. So we need a, a strategy for health that is non-tribal. We need a strategy to tackle the systemic race inequality and here's the point, Jennifer, which needs to be your North Star, and it, as it is our North Star. This isn't a um, zero-sum game. Uh, because we tackle racism doesn't mean we can't tackle white working class inequality and poverty. Uh, but we need to be, you need to be saying it as a white woman. I need to be saying it as, as a black man together uh, on, in, in, this, in this platform and demanding we have to be sure that it's non-negotiable. We won't engage with culture wars. We won't engage in divide and rule. Uh, too much at stake. Yeah, yeah, that's marvellous. Thank you so much, Simon. Let, let, let's move on to, um, to Sakti Karananithi, who is our next speaker. Um, Sakti is Director of Public Health and Wellbeing in Lancashire County Council. And I think he's got a very, very interesting perspective Firstly, being in the Northwest in public health, because it's obviously been a hotspot, hasn't it, exactly for COVID. But also, secondly, in your position next to Greater Manchester in thinking about how na national and regional react together, work together or not in this pandemic, uh, particularly as you're not part of Greater Manchester and how that's worked out. Um, Sakthi is uh, leads on population health and digital health for Lancashire and South Cumbria integrated care system, and he has a long experience in addressing the wider determinants of health in the region. So, Sakthi, I really think your perspective here is going to be very important for moving forwards, because as we know, and as Claire was saying, it's local that really matters too, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for your kind introduction, and um, it is a it is a great privilege and an honor to be part of this, this panel. So uh, another thank you. Um, I sit here in front of you all as a paradox myself. Um, someone who is a, an immigrant um, from an Asian minority uh, origin, but here heading up a response to the public health crisis in Lancashire where and across the country where my fellow um, ethnic minority doctors and communities have uh, died more um, and at the same time addressing the inequalities that are in our deprived communities across ethnicities and across uh, the communities here. Um, 
and that is very important for me as myself as an who am I in terms of my identity, but also it's a paradox um, that we can't get away with. And I think I want to do three things in the next um, handful of minutes. First of all, just place this whole thing about inequalities in a, in a bit of a historical context. Um, and then share my thoughts uh, in response to what you introduced me to and um, hopefully paint a, paint a future that everybody can engage. In terms of the historical location of, of this, um, I did some homework in tracing back the documented history of inequalities uh, in Britain. And it's not just a 40 year old history, it's not, didn't start just after the war. In fact, it goes as back as 400 years where we do seem to have a documented history of good law when there was an Elizabethan poor law, which, was, which is known as the forgotten poor law in the 1600s, where there was an extremely good levels of protection for the vulnerable and the poor. In fact, it, there was a, a lecture in Cambridge University which documents that when the famine hit um, compared to the rest of the Europe, Britain's poor didn't suffer. There wasn't a, a, a disproportionate impact on life expectancy and mortality when the grain prices went up, apparently. Um, however, when um, the 1834, the, the poor law that we know um, was um, in place, apparently it was the enemy. Well, we know that it was the enemy of the working class and, and, and the poor. And, um, um, and there is a link which I really want to draw on, which is investment as a percentage of GDP, which was cut by half between the forgotten poor law and the original poor law that we know about, which has a direct correlation between well-being and life expectancy. So I just want to be a bit provocative um, in asking how can we change what is centuries old inequalities that's really ingrained in our society through generations be changed um, in the next decade or in the short span of our lifetimes. Just to highlight the idea that it is going to be, it's going to have to be a multi-generational um, aspiration that we need to have for uh, in our society. And also to highlight the fact that there is a direct correlation about the state's spending on well-being and welfare of the most vulnerable and inequalities, let's be very clear. Um, the second thing I want to highlight, in, in the vein of COVID and various other things that I've experienced and we've all experienced, the best PPE to recover from the health inequalities after COVID is not your face masks and gloves and aprons. It's the real PPE, which is the politics the philosophy of life and the economics. Politics, not in terms of party politics, but the policies that need to be intersectoral, cross-governmental, international, to, to address the threat that the humanity faces in this, in this century. And we have seen time and time again, um, the lack of or presence of coordination has direct impacts on even communicating the risks to our communities during, um, during the pandemic. The, the philosophy of life that actually addresses the moral values. Um, Simon mentioned um, a number of things and, and the philosophy that really addresses the social justice. What is right and what is wrong? What is ethical? What do we value? I think there is a big conversation that we really need to address head on. And, and the economics, an economic that is inclusive, economics that is kind to the nature and, and, and an economy that invests in prevention. And most importantly, things have already been said before, um, the economics that values health as a human capital. We forget that at our peril. And there are so many statistics around the lost GDP just due to poor health um, in our economy and how that scales up um, hugely 
against even the spend in the NHS, for instance. And I, therefore, I, I do think that we are uh, actually facing a perfect storm, given the historical context and the need for a better PPE in addressing health inequalities um, in our nation. And in fact, it's, uh, it's also the day where I think the LGA have also published a perfect storm, health inequalities and impact of COVID, which, which highlights um, so many things. So I think we are going through a period of big things um, being discussed and big thoughts uh, that we need to have to, to, address, um, to address what we are uh, going to face, um, what we inherit from the past and take into the future. And the hope uh, and a, a real, um, a, the critical thing here in my experience is when we see things beyond party politics, especially uh, places like Lancashire and other parts of the country where um, it deprived more vulnerable, there has not been a specific eye to protect or support. There has been a lot of sanctions on areas, my own uh, part of the world, most of the last 18 months have been under some restrictions or the other. Um, support, local flexibility, local empowerment, money. Uh, some of the things will not have uh, been able to uh, do in the last 18 months, changing the whole quality of the housing and that sort of thing. But what has really held well is when there has been a shared leadership, leadership as a role that people do in relation to each other, not in positions that we hold, a shared leadership, the shared purpose, that has the, what I keep coming back to is a first rate intelligence, being able to see the common things in things that are seemingly opposite. For instance, personal responsibility and role of state, protecting the economy and protecting health. These are seemingly opposite concepts, which uh, are not actually opposite concepts and our ability to see the commonalities in this um, given health is a human capital is going to be really really key and and final remark from me is that the leadership that exists in our society which is not just for people in leadership roles but across the sections of society to acknowledge the biases to acknowledge our prejudices and be comfortable in having the debates and arguments, not to uh, score points, but to make progress is what I think we will need as a, as a society going forward. And your report, the report from Health Foundation, does give us the, the home, the hook for having that big conversations for big things to happen. Thank you again, Jennifer. Thank you, Malaysia. And thank you for all the speakers that went before. Very inspiring. Thank you, though. Thank you, Zachary. Um, just a question for you then. I, I mean, obviously, philosophy change and leadership at national level are very important, as we all know, but often governments have tin ears, they have other agendas, as we also know. Um, if they do, what is the scope now for local government to, in a sense, call, some more, call in, some more shots on the back of this? Yeah. I mean, obviously, we're waiting, aren't we, for the local government, you know, the devolution within England bill. I know this is, English, sorry to Scottish and Welsh uh, listeners and Northern Irish listeners, uh, but some of this has got to be to do with the national and local division of power, isn't it, and autonomy. But even within the current arrangement, while we wait for that, um, have you seen local government uh, councils working more closely together? Sort yes, of if, if, if it wasn't for the platforms created at a local level, often led by local governments and the local forums, the resilience forums, which provided the platform for that interdepartmental coordination, intersectoral coordination, ranging yeah. from supporting vulnerable communities through hubs to actually managing concurrent emergencies and and so on. I can't imagine how we, the society would have been held together without that, the role of the local government. Um, so it plays an incredibly important part, but often forgotten in investments, often forgotten in the value and the local insights about the communities they have and how closely they work with local communities. I personally, uh, if there is one silver lining in this crisis, it was, it brought people together more than we ever have been. Although we were distancing, we were working together. 
So we need to hold on to and put roadblocks consciously so that we don't, when we do discover um, the normality again, we hold on to some of these positive things that we've experienced um, as a way of working going forward. Thank you very much, Sakthi. Well, lots of things to return to there too. So I'm being a rubbish chair because we, 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 we're quite delayed, but actually it's been so rich. I hope people are, are okay with me going with it. And I'm now very pleased to introduce our final speaker on the panel, who's Rachel Wolfe, uh, a founding partner at Public First. Uh, Rachel has had a very interesting career uh, already, uh, which has spanned businesses, charities, politics and government, big G government. And she was previously advisor to the Prime Minister on Education and Innovation and was also the co-author of the Conservatives 2019 General Election Manifesto. You're looking surprised, Rachel, but that's what it says on the no, 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 That's all true. <laughs> Very good. So uh, you, you'll have your own um, comments on this, but I, I really do think the political picture will be very important to plug on, particularly this whole business about levelling up and is it real and the role of local government and central government uh, re, re, you know, response relationship. Thank you. So I'll be brief. I know we need to get to questions. Uh, I just want to quickly say again, I, I thought the presentation was fantastic and really interesting. Um, another piece of data I remember seeing recently from the ONS was about the massive difference between the percentage of people in different places that had worked from home, like in Richmond and in the rest of the country where almost no one had worked from home and they'd been sent, you know, they were critical key workers or they were working in factories. And of course, this has made a monumental difference to their experience over the last 18 months. But you've asked me to talk about the political picture. So I'll do that very briefly. I think the first thing, um, and this probably sounds rather more sympathetic than many other panelists, but if you go back 18 months now to what the government already had on its plate before COVID happened. It was, I think, quite gargantuan in that it had three core aims, all of which were enormous. Uh, the first is levelling up, which in itself encompasses radical improvements to public services, improvement in place, which has not really been a factor in this conversation today, but it comes up again and again in, in all the focus groups that we do, you know, feeling that your high street, your place, your community is thriving, and also encompasses opportunity in the short term and long term. Are there training opportunities? Are there retraining opportunities? Can my children get on? Um, where is this place going? So that, that's just task number one. And on top of that, trying to negotiate uh, the economy in position post Brexit, and also achieve net zero, another huge draw on the government's pension capacity and money. And that was before COVID hit. And then what has happened since is the government has become exhausted, spent vast sums of money on furlough and increased uh, employment support and indeed keeping the health service going. Um, and has seen many of the issues that had already identified move backwards. So, you know, let's take something that wasn't race day, but if you look at say the high street, it's in the even worse position than it was 18 months ago. If you look at children's education, then we have seen very, very frightening moves backwards, particularly for specific groups. And we don't know if they're gonna be able to catch up. So they're facing, they're more tired, they have less money, they have more draws on their money, and they have even more challenges than they did 18 months ago. And what they are going to have to do, and what is politically, incre I haven't even got social care, what is politically incredibly difficult for them to do is number one, to prioritize, but number two, and I thought Claire talked about this very compellingly, to combine being able to show some tangible achievements in a parliamentary term, because we are a democracy and voters very reasonably expect to see some results from their vote. They want to feel that there was a reason that they voted, particularly since many of them had never voted for the Conservatives before, while putting in the long-term structures in place that might actually see changes in areas that had suffered from underinvestment, um, that in areas where, for example, we have a skill system that has undersupported people training and retraining for generations, where we have major issues in how we do prevention health. You know, we talked before this session about obesity, which is obviously a huge driver of some of the health inequalities, but where we're not even sure we know how to tackle it. Um, so I think that the government faces more challenges than any other, certainly since the post 1940s government and, and also huge opportunities. Um, and, and their trick 
which I don't think I could uh, achieve is to, is to marry those opportunities. Where do we see job growth? Where do we see opportunity growth? Where do we see the greatest potential for change to these areas that are struggling the most? Um, I think we're all waiting with breathless anticipation for how the leveling up paper is gonna solve all those problems. And I'm sure Neil O'Brien is not suffering any sleepless nights at our expectation that he's gonna solve those problems, but it is what they're going to have to set out the sort of. I think you only have 15 minutes left for questions. So I will stop there. Um, and uh, hopefully that gave some flavor of what they're having to deal with. Thank you, Rachel, but I asked everyone else a very quick supplementary, so I won't leave you out here. So um, understood, leveling up Brexit net zero, those are quite long-term things, aren't they? But they can do something quite quickly, which is they could provide more money into local government baselines, do some of the basic um, human and ca social capital building that has been kind of destroyed over the last 10 years, hasn't it? So why do, why do they do that? Why do they... Why isn't local government more part of the picture? Why wasn't it involved in the plan for growth, for example, the, you know, the, the treasury beginning bare bones of an economic strategy? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And, and I've written about this before, because I agree with you that some of the kind of baseline social and cultural and place-based interventions that you'd historically expect local governments to be at the center of and driving yeah. are exactly what people want to see. And it's very hard to imagine how in the long term, let alone the short term, you achieve these sort of cross-cutting things um, without serious localization. Yeah. I think the truth is governments find it very, I mean, this government is not unusual. All British governments have found it incredibly hard to let go. They are very centralizing. The treasury is inordinately centralizing. Um, and every time the sort of opportunity for dramatic localization has emerged, it, it's broadly not happened because of that instinct. I, I agree with you, it has to. Yeah. And given the money swirling around in the, you know, the, the repatriation of the EU funds and the shared prosperity funds, you know, the, the worry is that that's going to be fragmented, centrally held, the purse strings, the criteria are going to be set centrally and actually local governments and local people are going to have less of a say, which is what's happening with the levelling up funds at the moment, isn't it? They're not distributed according to the deprivation. Well, I think it's also about the decision making structure, right? Because as you said, towns and places are different from each other they have different needs and they have different requirements um yeah. and they have different identities i think one poll we did recently showed that people's identity is actually more tied to their local place than it is nationally even and, and whenever you talk to people there are there are very specific things about those places that they identify and understand um yeah. any successful leveling up strategy has to root through those people otherwise it it, it won't achieve what they want yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. That, that's terrific, Rachel. Um, so now, as a rubbish chair, I'm now going to come to some of the most upvoted questions. So there's some, some sort of researchy type ones. So Charlie Redmond uh, asked the question, the report covers a huge array of evidence and research. Where are the key gaps, do you think? So I think that's one for Marinesha and Claire. Um, Charlie, really, really good question. It's one that we've been contending with throughout the inquiry. Uh, a, a really big one in terms of evidence gaps is around groups that lie below the data line. We have a very particular way of collecting routine data, um, and, and that means um, homeless populations, traveler communities, as well as um, ethnic minority communities who don't fall within um, many of the predictable and conventional ways of us collecting data do fall through that net. We have tried to curate um, some of the evidence gathering to address some of these data gaps by commissioning very specific pieces of work. But if you do want more information about, about that, then please do, do get in touch. Thank you. So I think you've answered that particular question. Perhaps I can ask Claire a different one, Claire. So th there's a question at the beginning about how does this inquiry feed into the government's inquiry when it obviously it's a, it's a, this is a different inquiry. This is obviously not a government inquiry. But um, how do you see it as chair feeding into what, what will be hopefully a government inquiry? So, uh, I mean, I think it provides a fantastic evidence base. Uh, I mean, what, what we were always trying to do through the inquiry was to bring together, um, so you know, some of the some of the massive evidence that's been created. If you look on the, uh, the the sort of the databases of research into COVID nineteen, there were kind of two and a half thousand um, separate pieces of research within about 
couple of months of the start of the pandemic. So, and, and, and what we found when we started the inquiry was everywhere, people were, were looking at different aspects. And what we tried to do through the inquiry was to bring some of those together and see what emerged as the really big picture, um, uh, you know, the, the big themes, both of what was happening through the pandemic and of where that might take us to in the future. So I would hope that it would, you know, it would be a useful uh, starting point among, you know, again, among many others for uh, for the government in understanding the types, the, the groups of people that need to be uh, thought about the, the different ways of considering the uh, the effects and particularly I mean like that obviously the an inquiry almost by its nature is backward looking uh, and with the inquiry with with our inquiry while our data was inevitably present and backward looking we were always trying to be uh, forward looking um, but hopefully by the time we get to the inquiry some of that will have panned out as well so we'll be able to see how the kinds of things that we were pointing to um, have you know have transpired over the uh, the intervening months. Lovely, thank you. And that reminds me to just point out to the, for those interested in listening that um, in addition to this inquiry, the Health Foundation put together a, a very interesting policy tracker, which tracks every single major policy that has affected health during the pandemic. It's a voluminous piece of work, but it's available online for you to have a look at and check. And hopefully that will also be useful to the inquiry to re remind us who said what and when and what happened. So thank you. So I think this is a question for Sakti. Um, uh, no spend on prevention as no immediate results and no long term plans with short political cycles. How can this be changed? Can new healthcare systems, ICSs, help to rectify the focus on prevention? And if so, how? And I think I would add to that the focus on primary care as well as prevention, because we know in the last 20 years that the acute sector has gobbled up the NHS resources relative to primary care. So ICS land, Sakti, how can we how can that help? I think ICSs uh, do have a major role to play. Certainly the rhetoric and some of the indications in terms of how the policy landscape for the NHS in terms of addressing health inequalities, um, they do have a significant role here, both as um, a service delivery organization that uh, listens to local communities and changes the service models to to um, align with and to ma marry the local aspirations, as well as a major employer and a contributor to uh, greenhouse gases and so on. But in the same breath, I would add that ICS is on its own um, will not be able to make a major dent on the health inequalities. And in fact, it needs to be indeed a cross governmental um, initiative. I would, dare I say, led by the Treasury and education alongside uh, the HSE to make this uh, make this a, a sticking thing and not necessarily just ICS. So ICSs definitely are necessary but not sufficient to address health inequalities at the scale that we're seeing now. Thank you. I think the bill's being listened to today, isn't it? The NHS bill that would further the ICSs. Thank, thank you very much, Sakti. So they have a place to play, a role to play. So there's a question I think which is for Simon, which is from Jabir Bhatt. Um, who is making the point that he thinks that there is growing evidence that, that there is a culture war being promulgated by government that might reduce the likelihood of addressing racial equality. Simon, is that your sense of where the wind is blowing? Or, or, or are yes. you more hopeful? Yeah, I mean, not right across government. I, I, I think there, there are a few individuals within government that are, that are you know, just, just love this stuff and I don't, I'm not quite sure why. Well, my guess is, is to win votes in the north of England in white working class areas um, would be would be my guess. And it's not helpful, not not at a time like this. But I think there's sometimes there's parallel parallel universes. I think, uh, for example, in businesses, they want ethnic minority pay gap reporting. They, they they've been chastised. They've been they've been chastened by the conversations that they've had uh, with their black, uh, Asian and minority ethnic staff. And I'm sure health trust, too. I've been having these challenging conversations and then pivoting towards a better place. So there's one parallel universe that sees this, as Claire said, as a, as a, a wonderful opportunity, actually. And then another side, and another side that is wants to roll us back to the 1950s. I, I want to go with the former because the former is a win, 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 and how. Yes, thank you. And I think you raise an important point there, which is that government is important, but it's not the only player to help change the weather here. 
And actually, at the foundation, we obviously are an endowed foundation. We've got involved with quite a few investors who are putting pressure on companies to do the right thing. We've obviously seen that with green, haven't we? And there's a beginning to, to see that with other things like the pay gap between the genders and, and other agendas. So there are other groups that can, corporate groups, I think, that can provide some pressure, um, at, at least on this, on this area as well. Um, which actually then leads me to Rachel, because there's a question here about what, if we want to change the weather on inequalities, which as Sakthi says, have been around for 400 years, but if we want to use the pandemic, what, can, what do we have to learn from the way that the green issues have come up the agenda in the last decade that actually we could sort of learn from, do you think? I think that's a great question because uh, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, if you polled most of the people in this country, uh, climate change would not have been high on the agenda. Yeah. It is now very high on the agenda across age, across class. Um, and it's obviously become a dramatic um, uh, part of both the government and other parties' agendas. I think the thing that has really changed in climate change is that people now understand the impact it could have, with a big caveat, on their children and grandchildren. It feels immediate and it feels about their families and their communities. And I, I say with one caveat, because the truth is what people are is environmentally engaged. There's still very low understanding of climate change or, or any of these issues, but, but they're worried about their families and their communities and therefore it feels both universal and immediate. And, and in some sense, it, it ties to what I feel has been quite a strong thread of this conversation, which is how do you have a narrative and set of policies that feel that they are uniting people and are relevant to people and their communities and their families rather than divisive. And I think that is what has now happened with climate change. It could change again though. And I think that's the other thing that's worth remembering, which is we have yet get to the point, and I think there is a way through, and I spend a lot of my time working on this, but we have yet to get to the point where we've told people how they're gonna pay for this or what they're gonna to have to do. And so there is always that moment where narrative and ambition and opportunity becomes reality. And you have to be very, very careful that in doing it, what you're not doing is, for example, making fuel pool pay people even poorer, which is a huge risk with climate change. Um, but in the end, it's about your children and your grandchildren and your community. Yeah. And perhaps thank you for that, because I think that then the last word, which will probably have to be about 30 seconds from Claire, I will turn to Claire because of your long experience in government. Clearly, some of the thread today is about looking at the future and looking at our children's children or our friends' children's children rather than ourselves. So the future well-being of generations, which the Welsh call it, don't they, the well-being, and the New Zealanders also think about this. So how do we bind commitment into the longer term? And, and do you think the COVID pandemic has seared the politicians enough to be able to shift their equilibrium here towards the future? Um, so I would love to think that it has, uh, and, and this goes back to the point that Simon was making earlier about the, you know, that 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 impact early on in the in the pandemic of seeing, uh, you know, when, when the days when we used to see uh, the photographs of all the people who died uh, very early on when there were small numbers and so many of them were, you know, black faces and and it did have it was a real jolt to everybody uh, and there was a sense that you know. Uh, you know inequalities were coming up the agenda and there was and there was a real desire to do something about it I don't know I genuinely don't know if there is uh, if we are in a position where we can really um, leverage that change I would like to think that we can the just just kind of tying back to what what Rachel say one of the one of the really interesting things about the way in which the, the environment generally um, gathered uh, momentum as an issue um, if you think back to Blue Planet, um, when I was in DEFRA, the, the Blue Planet series came out, it made a huge uh, impact, um, you know, one television series. But, but when we were talking about it, one of the things that helped was that there were solutions. So we spent a long time worrying about plastic and there were no alternatives. And one of the things that made a difference was actually that from a technological point of view, alternatives came along. So there's a really interesting question about can we bring together uh, you know, a moment of interest in making a, a difference happen with having solutions, you know, readily available that people can move into. Because we do need to think, we need, we need to give people places to go as well as uh, a reason 
reason to make that move. So it's the it's the burning platform, but also somewhere to jump to, which I think is the is the magic combination if we can get there. Thank you, Claire, for that. So that's our task for the next period for the Health Foundation. We're bang on 13.15. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you particularly to our speakers, a fantastically rich combination of, of speakers. Thank you so much for all of that. What you should watch again on demand. We'll send the link. Next webinar on primary care, 15th of July. Um, and for those of you who want further updates, oh, I'm being cut off, I think, but if I'm not, please um, uh, check our updates and sign up to them as you see with the link there. I think that's probably enough for now. I hope you enjoy the report. Please join us with further work in this area, which will surely happen. And many thanks and goodbye for now. Thank you.